All right, we can do this, right? Just a little bit more. But that being said, okay, so that being said, let's see, so this stuff, so we're starting to go through the list of, um, of questions that, of, of like what the final exam is gonna be. The final exam is almost done, which means we have a pretty good idea what's gonna be covered and what's not going to be covered. And so I've started taking up Right, I took all the learning objectives from each of the tests previously and put them into one big document and started crossing things out. Oh, I, I saw that on the, the unpublished page. Yeah. So that will be um, that'll be good. So hopefully we'll be able to publish that pretty quickly and you will all be able to see exactly what you don't need to worry about. Now I say that, but of course, most of what we're going to cover in these last couple of weeks is examinable. Okay, so I do want to just emphasize that that uh, you know we've taken out huge swaths of stuff like all the perpetu perpetuities is gone, so we're not going to worry about perpetuities, for example. But almost everything in this section is examinable, so you do want to make sure that even though we're kind of in the dregs right now, right, like struggling to survive. Um, that this stuff is still going to be covered. So you want to make sure you're okay with it. Oh, yeah. And then isn't the last test technically have a lot more uh, that's examinable on it because you only did derivatives on the, uh, the last one? Yeah. So we've also been talking about, we haven't made the test, term test eight yet. And we're talking about should, whether or not we should cut some things from term test eight. We haven't made that call yet, but we're going to make that next week. So we'll decide then. Um, and that's going to play into, you know, also what's covered on the final exam. Oh, yeah, if you um, cut stuff, then it's probably fair game to expect it to be on the exam. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> uh, the very last week, Sana, is not on the term test because the term test is that week, right? So we have next week, which would have been the when we normally had term test eight. Um, but of course, we have Good Friday or whatever, which is statutory holiday, so we can't have a test that day. Uh, so it got pushed to the following week, but obviously that week's material won't be on the test. So yeah, all the uh, iterated integrals and that stuff will show up uh, that week, but won't be tested. I think we'll get up to 30 people by the end of this. Yeah, I think we could pull through. We're lucky. I guess that depends if we're including you or both of your things and me and that or That's not. That's true. That is true. Yeah, it's okay. You know what? Like I said, and I've said before, right? If you all can do well just based off the videos and practice, that's phenomenal to me. If you want to do this course entirely asynchronously, I am 100% for that and will support you in whatever way I can. On the other hand, if you want to come and you want to participate, um, I think that will increase you know, your engagement and, and your understanding of the material. And if you want to come and do that, phenomenal. I'll help you there as well, right? So you know, just whatever learning thing best works for you, let's do that, right? And the test marks have been solid, right? No, there are no classes on the Friday, but there are classes on the following Monday. And Thalen, that's because Easter Monday isn't actually a stat holiday. A lot of people yeah. take it off, but it's not actually statutory. Right, and it originally that uh, Good Friday would have would have been basically the last day of class, right? But we pushed everything a week, so. And now there's an exam on a Sunday. Mm hmm. Okay, so this is actually a counting problem, right? You guys see that? This is a counting problem. <laughs> All right, you got three variables. How many, what is the total number of fourth order partial derivatives you can have, right? You're just counting how many ways are there of possibly computing a fourth order derivative. 
So all that counting stuff we did way back in uh, November suddenly is coming back. Okay, so five minutes, I'm gonna wrap this up in 30 seconds or so, we'll take it up. Gotta say, I'm happy with the test marks though, so far. I think they're going pretty well. Not like everyone's getting 100%, but I think the marks are pretty good. Definitely higher than they were my year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. that. That makes me happy. I think the highest test average of my year was a 58. Yeah, and this year it was like a 60 something, median was 70, it was pretty good. But who knows why that is? Maybe there's a. I mean, there's the bunch of reasons that could <laughs> potentially be the case. Clearly, right. it's just your new TA hire. That's exactly it. Uh, okay. So the question is so we've got f as a function of three variables. Let me just name those variables explicitly. So this is slide eight. So we've got f is a function of three variables. Let's give them names x, y, and z. And we want to figure out. Hey, Sana, I mean, if you guys, you guys might just be smarter. There's the ebb and flow of every year of students. Okay, so we want to figure out how many different fourth order derivatives are there. Okay, and let me just kind of like start naming a couple of them and hopefully we'll get into a pattern and we'll see like, okay, what do we do? So for example, we could take something like an x, 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 x derivative, right? This is a four derivative just with respect to x. Or, you know, maybe we could do like a y, y, z, x derivative or something like that, right? Or z, x, y, z derivative. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out, well, what are all the possible ways, right? What are all the possible ways to basically choose which derivatives that we want to take, right? Ways to choose which variables to differentiate. All right, so I think this is a counting problem because the way I see it here, I'm gonna draw this really, really big. So we're gonna take the derivative and then I've got four boxes, right? Because we're taking a fourth order derivative here. Right? And what I need to do is I need to choose, uh, I need to figure out how many different ways there are of putting things into these boxes. Well, how many options do I have for this box? Oh, yeah, three, exactly. Okay, this box, yeah. And you see it's just three for every box, right? So by the basic counting principle, how many ways are there of how many four possible fourth order derivatives are there? Yeah, exactly. Three to the power of four equals 81 fourth order derivatives. Okay, does that make sense? Right now, in practice, if I asked you to compute all of the fourth derivatives of a function, you don't actually have to compute 81 of them, right? Clarou's theorem, which is a theorem that we've learned, tell us that you know the order of the variables doesn't matter, right? This may be worth kind of talking about very quickly, in case you don't recall. But Clarou says that the order of the variables doesn't matter; only how many of them there are. So the, I'm, the, I'm not going to give the formal statement of Clarell. I'll just kind of give you the, the Coles notes. So the order of the variables does not matter. Right? Only the count matters. So how many of each of them there are? So what I mean by this is the following. 
So die x, x, y, z, f. So this thing has two x's. It's got two x's, uh, one y, and one z. And so that's going to be the same as something like y, x, z, x, f, because it also has two x's in it, a y and a z, or maybe something like, uh, what do we want? z, y, x, x, right? Two x's, a y, and a z. All of these things are going to be exactly the same, right? That's what Clearview's theorem tells us. If these things exist and are continuous, you're allowed to rearrange the, you, you can basically differentiate them in any order as long as the, you get the same count uh, of variables in each situation, right? So in our case, two x's, one y, and one z. Does that make sense? Any questions? <laughs> well, I uh, unfortunately, I don't think it gets much better than that. But it's good to know. So here you go. Here's a question. And this is a counting problem. Again, suppose that I give you a function of four variables. How many six order partials are there of this form? It stayed a little bit weirdly, but again, so we've got two x's, two y's, a z, and a w. So what I'm asking is, how many derivatives are there that have two x's, two y's, a z, and a w in it? Oh, I got to relaunch the poll. Interesting, interesting. We might have to go back and review our counting. Yeah, Sarah's not here either, I don't think. So the order does not matter. We just want to know what is basically, what are all the ways that we can write x, x, y, y, z, w? Let's think about it like that, Selena. So if we want to rephrase this as like a counting problem, what are all the possible ways that we can write x, x, y, y, z, w? Okay, so we're at 66%. So let's do another uh, 40 seconds or so. <laughs> That's all right, it happens. It's not worth marks. And the last question, the order doesn't matter. So we're saying in the previous one, we were saying, what's just the total number of fourth or fourth order derivatives you can compute? So saying the, the, there we were pretending that the order mattered, even though we knew that it didn't, right? Um, so we're saying like, if we ignored the fact that these were all equal, what's the total number of them? 
So Selena, let me, I'll do an example right when we're done this and kind of show you what the difference is. Um, and hopefully that'll clarify it for you a bit. Okay. All right. Okay. So we kind of came through in the end. So our answer here is A. A is the correct answer. And that's where the majority of us fell in terms of consensus uh, with a little bit of people in B and D. So B is the correct answer if you were just, if the question was, how many sixth order partial derivatives are there, period, right? Like what was the total number of sixth order partial derivatives? Um, but this one specifically said we want to have two x's, two y's, z, and a w, and that's going to change the problem around. Okay, so uh, this is equivalent. So let's see, this is slide nine. And basically the question is, how many ways can we write x, x, y, y, z, w? Okay, right? That's effectively the question that we're asking by Clarus theorem. Now, if you go back and you think about, again, like November when we were talking about counting, this is a repeated permutation, right? Uh, so if we could distinguish all of these numbers or all these letters, x, x, y, y, z, w, there would be six factorial ways of doing this. So if we could distinguish every letter, there would be six factorial ways. Right, because there's six for the first option, five for the second, four for the uh, third, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there are two re uh, repetitions, right? The X is repeated twice and the Y is repeated twice. And the way that we fix that, that X is repeated twice and Y is repeated twice So we have to divide out by the number of times that those repetitions occur. And so we're going to get six factorial divided by two factorial, two factorial, right? And that was A. All right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's, uh, un can I zoom out? Sure. Now there isn't, um, you know, kind of the problem when you do examples of like third and fourth order derivatives is computing third and fourth order derivatives of a single variable function can get quite complicated, let alone of a multivariable function. But let me see if I can give you an example. So let's say that I gave you something like the Hessian. So as kind of like a side example, let's say I gave you this function. Uh, let's just make something up. F of X, Y, Z is X squared y cubed z to the four. Okay, and I want to keep it relatively simple so it's not too hard to actually differentiate. And let's say I said, well, how many uh, third order derivatives are there total, right? So we kind of have two questions here. So how many third order questions, how many third order derivatives are there? Uh, how many third order derivatives are there total, right? I'm not asking how many unique third order derivatives there are, just what is the total number of them? And we know that there's going to be exactly due 27, right? So we've got three options for each of them. And I don't want to write them all out, but we know this three times three times three equals 27, right? So 27 is the answer here. But then I could say uh, how many are of the form Uh, x, z, z, right? Well, we can just list them all out, right? So there's x, z, 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 x, z, x, z, z. And those are the only three ways of arranging uh, these, these letters, right? One x and two z's. And we can check them if you want. Let's compute di x, z, z, right? 
So this says, remember when we, it doesn't matter, but strictly speaking, when we read this, we read it from right to left. So we're going to take the Z derivative, then the Z derivative, then the X derivative. So strictly speaking, when we do this, we're going to compute it uh, left to right, or sorry, right to left. So if we do this, we're going to get di x z of, uh, let, let me take the z derivative. So that's going to be 4x squared y cubed z cubed. Then I'm going to take another z derivative. So it's going to be 12x squared y cubed z squared. And then I'm going to take an x derivative, which is going to give me 24x. Uh, why am I having trouble over here? x, y cubed, z squared, right? And I won't do all three, but maybe let's do another one. Let's do like a mixed one, x, z, x, like that. Or maybe let's do that totally opposite one, z, z, x. So we start with an x derivative. We're going to 2x, y cubed, z to the 4. We'll take a z derivative. So it gives me 8 x, y cubed, z cubed. And then one more z derivative, y cubed, z squared. OK, I repeated the first and last. Oh, yeah, you're right. I did. That was silly. z, z, x, thank you. Yeah, they're all equal. And we see that they are, right? So. Right, and you can check the other one. Yeah, we didn't we didn't have to compute this three times, or I didn't have to compute this twice. Once I've done it once, I know what all of them are, right? And that's what I'm saying. So we, once you know what they are once, you know what all of them of the same type are. So, but why I did this computation is because I wanted to show you an example of, hey, listen, if we actually do this computation in different orders, miraculously, we end up getting the same result, which is pretty cool. Right? So it actually saves us a lot of time. If you ever have to uh, compute second, third, fourth order derivatives, there's a lot of repetition that ends up um, not needing to be done because of Clarus theorem. Right? Clarus theorem really saves you a lot of time and energy because once you've computed uh, a, one of the derivatives of each type, then you don't have to compute the rest. Okay? And so where this is really nice, for example, is when you're computing the Hessian, right? which is the matrix of second derivatives. Um, so you have to compute the diagonal, and then if you compute the upper like triangle, then you know what the lower triangle is. Yes, Stephanie. So for x, z, z, start at the rightmost z. So you can see I kind of like peeled them off from the right, right? So I took a z derivative, then a z derivative, then an x derivative. And then in the second example, when I did z, z, x, I took an x derivative, then a z derivative, then a z derivative. So I'm peeling them off from the right. But... This is an important, Stephanie, because you know that you can do them in any order you want, right? Like what we have learned once we believe Clarus theorem is that we don't care whether you actually have to read them right to left or left to right or whatever order uh, you want. You'll get the same answer no matter what you do. So I'm doing this just to illustrate that you get the same answer. But once you believe me about that, you can do them in any order that you want. Uh, on the Hessian matrix, sure, let me see if, uh, actually, you know what, here's a question on the Hessian. The next one, Jude, actually happens to be one. So I think that'll work out pretty well. And then we can go into it a little bit more if you want. Okay, so remember the Hessian matrix is the matrix of second derivatives, right? But in this case, we've actually plugged them in at a point. So here, I'm not gonna give you a function and ask you to compute the Hessian, but we're actually gonna go the opposite and I'm going to give you the Hessian and say, which of these functions give you this Hessian? And in fact, if you're clever about it, you don't have to compute the Hessian of all these functions, right? You just need to compute, you know, if you compute the uh, x, uh, z derivative, for example, of each of these four functions, only one of them will probably give you three, right? So you can like narrow it down very, very quickly. Is it supposed to be <clears throat> HF of zero, zero, zero? Uh, yes. Yeah, actually, thank you. Yeah, there should be a third zero in there.
And for the record, I have actually given the opposite question of this on a final exam, which is here is a Hessian, write down for me a function, which gives you this Hessian, right? So this multiple choice is a little bit easier because of course you can check which function does this, but imagine if this was actually your problem and it wasn't multiple choice and you actually had to sort it out for yourself, could you figure out a function on your own which gave you this Hessian? That's, that's the real question. That sounds fun. It is fun. It's funny actually, because I gave that same question to my 257 students one year and it just crushed them. But like, once I was like, just do it, just, just think about this. And then uh, they did and they were like, oh yeah, it's not that bad. This is a question that if you ask someone to do it, I think it seems much harder, but the moment somebody points out the obvious, you're like, okay, yeah, that's, that's not too bad. Yeah, sure, Sana, we can, we can cover that. But uh, here's how you think. Here's how you do. It. Uh, what if I what if I did gave you the same question but in in one dimension, right? What if I said, give me a function. This is the only thing I said. Give me a function whose second derivative at zero is uh, eight, right? What function would you give me? There's a bunch you could do, but there's some easy ones. So the second derivative at zero is eight, just a single variable function. So if you've answered this, I want you to think about that. Uh, yeah, hism. So 4x squared is a great answer, right? Because you know it actually doesn't depend on zero, right? Once you differentiate it twice, you get exactly the number eight, and so you don't care about where you put, plug it in. Okay, so now what if I told you that the, the top left element of the Hessian had to be eight, right? Okay, so Thalen, you think about this too. So if I told you that the top left element of the Hessian had to be eight, the, the xx derivative, what term would you guess, like how would you force the eight to appear in your, uh, in your derivative? Right, okay, so, you know that the you know that the top left uh, element, the one one element of the Hessian matrix, is the x x derivative, right? So, if I told you I wanted that to be eight, what term should appear in your function to guarantee that that is an eight? Like based off of what you just answered, right? Where I told you make the second derivative with respect to x be eight. Now do it with a multivariate function. What term can you put into your function to guarantee that that number is eight? Or maybe maybe uh, if that doesn't make sense, let's, let's go the other way. Suppose that your function was f of x, y, z is equal to four x squared. What is the Hessian of that matrix?
Okay, we're at 40 percent, but seven minutes. So let's do another minute or so, then we'll wrap it up. Well, what's the derivative of 4x squared with respect to y? Right, when you take the y partial, what do you do? You assume that all the other variables are constant, right? So what's the y derivative of 4x squared? No, 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 you didn't, you didn't forget. Okay, so remember, you're taking the y derivative. No, no, not one, you're close though. You're taking the y derivative of 4x squared. If you're taking the y derivative, x and z are constant. So 4x squared is a constant. What's its y derivative? Zero though, right? Yeah, zero, because it's constant, right? What's the z derivative of 4x squared? Yeah, zero again. So now you know how to compute the Hessian, right? So you have to compute the yy derivative, the yz derivative, the xz derivative, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, here. So we're over time. Let's, uh, let's look at our results here. All right, we're pretty evenly split here. Uh, so the correct answer is D. D is the only one that actually gives you um, the correct answer. And uh, you can check this here. I'll show you how you could have checked this very, very quickly. Um, but then we'll, why don't we then do, uh, and I'll show you how to actually go backwards. And if you're given a Hessian, how you could construct a function uh, which differentiates to it. Okay, so let's, let me just show you the quick way of doing this because it's multiple choice and then we'll go about it. So we know, so this is now slide 10. So we're told that the Hessian at zero, zero, zero is equal to two, one, uh, negative three, one, zero, four, negative three, four, negative six. Okay. So what I'm going to do is let's, let's do this thing. What, somebody tell me what derivative is this? What partial, second order partial derivative? xz, perfect. Or zx, right? Same thing. We know that that's true. So this is the xz or zx that are the same thing. And notice, notice something here as well. Let me just point this out. Notice that there's that negative three here because zx and xz are the same thing, right? Same thing, xy, yx, right? And yz, zy. So we get this kind of symmetry in the Hessian matrix, right? You don't actually have to compute all the elements. You only have to compute, in this case, six of them, and you would get all nine. OK, so this is di x z f 0, 0, right, as Jude points out. So let's compute for all three of our functions. Let's compute the x z derivative and see which of them gives us negative 3. And this is what I'm saying. Like, you don't actually have to compute the Hessian for every single one of these. Right? Let's just go through and see which of them give us uh, negative 3 as their xz derivative. So for a, we had 2x minus y minus 3z. All right, you all help me. What is the xz derivative of this function? So if I differentiate it with respect to z, then differentiate it with respect to x, what do I get? Okay, uh, let's do it here. Let's do it one at a time. So let me compute the z derivative. Yeah, Hasem's got it. So zero, right? So let's do the z derivative first. So the z derivative is just negative three, right? And then if I differentiate that with respect to x, that's the x derivative of just negative three. So that gives me zero. Does that make sense? You see how we got negative three? Okay, so it's not this one, right? Uh, because we need negative three to show up as the second derivative. 
zero. This is not equal to negative three, so it can't be this function. All right, let's try B. So in B, we had x squared z to the negative six gross plus xz minus e to the negative three xz plus four xy. I'm suddenly uh, regretting my choice of xz. Um, but if we differentiate this with respect to, I'm going to do x first. So we're going to get two xz to the negative six plus z plus three z e to the x uh, plus four y and then die zx f is ugh, gross um negative 12 x z to the negative seven plus one don't you still need stuff in the uh, exponent of that e uh oh yeah you're right negative three x z thank you uh oh some nasty chain rule or product rule so e to the negative three x z plus uh, or minus three x z e to the negative three x z whatever it is it's not equal to negative three right you plug in zero here this is zero uh, let's see this is zero and so you actually just get out positive three and so that's not it's not this one either right gross c so we got two e to the x, right? Don't, don't do all the derivatives. This is what I'm saying. You can just, it is actually easier to just do this question backwards. But if you weren't certain what to do, I again, regret my choice of x and z. So I'm surprised you didn't just do the pure uh, derivatives. Uh, well, I actually made the pure derivatives work out as often as I could. Mm. Right, so for example, the one one element works in every case. Um, so the z derivative of this is what x e to the z plus e to the x. So the x z derivative is e to the z plus e to the x, which at zero zero is two, right? And then d. Uh, we get f of x, y, z is x squared minus 3z squared plus x, y minus 3xz plus 4yz. So let's compute the z derivative first. That gives me negative 6z minus 3x plus 4y. Uh, yeah, sure. Right, and this is the only one that gave me negative three as the answer. Right, so the answer is D. But that only works because it's multiple choice, right? This is the only one that works and we know that these are the only four possible answers. One of them has to be correct, so that works. Yuck, what a mess. So let's say that we wanted to do this question backwards, all right? Oh, and let's say, first of all, are there any questions about this? It's a little bit long, but right, that's just the nature of multivariate functions. There's a lot you have to do. Isn't backwards easier? Yes, I think it is. Um, yeah, I mean, backwards is easier because the function that fits is how I would do this backwards, right? But theoretically, I could have I can construct a function which gives me this Hessian that isn't any of these four functions. In which case, backwards isn't easier. It just happens to be in this case, the way I actually solved this is to do it backwards, okay? So let's try going backwards and let's see what happens. So we have HF000, and the 000 here is really just a distractor. It's not gonna make a difference. Negative three six. Okay. So what we know is we know that the x, x derivative has to be equal to what? What is the x, x derivative equal to? Two. Perfect. Okay. So if I, can somebody tell me a function that if I differentiate it twice with respect to x, I get the number two out? Make it the easiest function you can think of. 
She's been close. Yeah, just x squared, right? That what you're thinking with yours, the half will cancel the two and you'll just get one, right? All right, so x squared. Okay, great. Uh, what is di xy uh, equal to? One, great. Give me the easiest function such that the xy derivative, derivative of it is equal to one. The easiest function you can think of. Uh, so Chifeng, in your case, the y derivative of that function is zero though, right? Let's, let's think about this. Let's think about this going backwards. If I, uh, I want to integrate this with respect to y, and then I want to integrate this with respect to x, what do I get? So integrate it with respect to y and then integrate that with respect to x. Any ideas? Hey, some close, try that. Jude, there's no y's in there though. So if you differentiate that, you don't get any. There you go, Stephanie, thank you. And Jazdeep, yep, I see that you got it too. So hey, some try yours, because the problem is if you differentiate yours with respect to x, you get a constant, right? And then it'll become zero. And Jude, same thing with you. If I differentiate with respect to y, I just get zero, right? And that's bad because I need to get a one out. So the answer here is x, y because if I differentiate that with respect to x, I just get y. And if I differentiate that with respect to y, I get one. OK, let's do one more, and hopefully we'll see what the pattern is. What is the xz derivative of that? Negative 3, great. What is the easiest function you can think of, which gives me negative 3 in my xz derivative? So if, you an X, if that's the answer, it's not quite. That'll give me one if I differentiate it. But how can I fix that? Perfect. OK. So based off the Hessian above, so if I were to write these three functions in, OK, this isn't our answer, but I want to show you what happens. So if I write in x squared plus xy minus 3xz, my Hessian looks like this. And that's pretty close. We're missing a couple of things, right? These are missing. And do you see how we could just fix that? Does anyone see like what the pattern here is in order to make those numbers appear? Like how do I make how do I make the four appear? So how do I make this four, these four show up? Four y z perfect. And then how do I make that negative six appear? Now that's be careful with that one. How do I make that negative six appear? Uh, close, Hasten, but that doesn't quite work. Very close, but just check that. Very, you got to be a little bit careful. Right, negative three z squared. Right? Because don't forget that two there is gonna come down. Now that didn't happen with the mixed, right? It didn't happen with the mixed because x, y, there's no squares in x, y or x, z or y, z. But with those diagonal terms, you're gonna get the squared term. So anyway, the, the point is that by looking at your original matrix here, yeah, your function, you can just read it off, right? So it's going to be one half of the diagonals. So it's going to be x squared plus zero y squared minus three z squared. And then the off diagonals just whatever the coefficient is. Right, you're done. Does that make sense?
Are there questions about that? This seems like too much work, but. Uh, hey, some exactly the zero y squared is the y derivative. Uh, is the yy derivative, and so I used one half zero squared, right? Um, Jude, can I go over the last part again? Which which the last part? The where the the negative six came from, or yeah, okay. So this is the zz derivative, right? And so our idea is we want to do something times z squared, right? Some constant times z squared, such that if I differentiate it twice. I'll get negative six, right? Now, negative six doesn't work because if I use the, the power rule, that two comes down and we'll turn it into a, a, a negative 12. So what I'm gonna do is put a negative three there instead. And then that way, when the two comes down, I get the right number. Mm -hmm. And you, that's what you do with the diagonal ones, OK? So the off diagonals, you can just use the number that you get, right? Like you could see uh, to make, so this one, uh, how can I point this out? Oh, I didn't mean to make that. Uh, OK, so this one here shows up here. Uh, this negative 3 shows up here. And this four shows up here. So you can just use those numbers directly. But for the diagonal, you have to use the halves, right? And so that's how you do that. So that's how you do it backwards, which is to say, like, there's a, obviously that's a little bit tricky, but it's the sort of thing that if you, I think once you've seen it once, you're like, okay, I could probably reconstruct this if I really had to. Like, you now kind of have the, you see what the trick is, right? So, that's the uh, that's the sort of thing there. Can I zoom out? Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's the pretty much the whole answer. <clears throat> okay. So. I'm debating whether we should do the chain rule. I think we're just going to cut the chain rule from the whole damn course. Makes you feel hungry? I can't possibly conceive of why that would be true. <laughs> like, I don't know why this question could make you hungry. Um, let me show you. Let me show you what we have coming up. But I'm pretty sure we are going to. Uh, I'm going to executive action veto this part of the course. Why did we plug in a zero? Uh, just Jude, I was trying to show you that the zero in the middle of the matrix uh, is the coefficient of the y squared term, and that's why there was no y squared, right? Are partials generally seen as difficult? It depends on what you mean, Stephanie. I mean, there's definitely an extra layer of uh, complication, right? Okay, so this is what I want to show you here. This is the chain rule. Okay, so the multivariate chain rule is very messy. So here is, we're not going to do this question. I don't want you to start doing it. Uh, yeah, it is. It's for sure ugly. So here is a function, uh, and you I've asked you to compute its derivative, and it's very messy. And then here is another function, chain rule. And here's another thing, chain rule. I think what we're going to do, we've already cut chain rule from the final exam. And I don't think any of us want to do it in test eight either. And I don't think it's that important. Jordan, can you think of any reason in future years why they would need a chain rule, multivariate chain rule? Mm, no. Okay. Because they like anytime that they have a um, 
uh, a multivariable function, like half to three quarters of the time, they end up transforming it into a single variable using constraints. Okay. So I think what we're going to do here is I'm going to talk to the other instructors and we're just going to unanimously veto the inclusion of the chain rule. And so nobody needs to worry about this material. How's that sound? Okay, cool. In that case, that's actually going to cover it for today. Um, and so obviously these are my office hours. I'm happy. <laughs> she thinks hunger, hunger has vanished. Uh, so that covers it. only hunger for knowledge. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I'm happy to hang around and answer any questions. No, no. I mean, you definitely still need to know single variable chain rule. <laughs> you can't get rid of that one. Uh, right? Just because it's, it's going to show up everywhere. Right, it's like it even shows up in in the partial derivatives when you do like not chain rule partial derivative uh, multivariable. Right, it just shows up uh, here. Let me show you an example, just so I can show you what I mean. Um, right, so let's say I asked you to do something like, you know, find the partial derivative of ln of. Now let's do something like e to the square root x squared plus y, right? Like there's a chain rule there for sure, right? It's a single variable chain rule because you're pretending that y is a constant, but for sure it's a chain rule, right? So you can't, yeah, you're not gonna be able to avoid the single variable chain rule, but the multivariable chain rule is really nasty, really disgusting and, and has dubious utilities. So uh, we will skip that, but you definitely for sure need to know single variable chain rule. Are there going to be extra obstacles before the exam? All the instructors will definitely have, I can probably stop.